to be in the house of the Lord. Again, it's good to, to be in the house of the Lord. Psalm 100, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with thanks, with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the people of his pasture. Let's stand as we sing, um, blessed be the name.
please join me in prayer. Truly, Lord, you are exalted, exalted on high. We honor you, we praise you, we glorify your name. Thank you so much for being our God. And thank you so much for loving us. Father, we pray this morning that you would be with our congregation here in our sanctuary and over the internet. Father, you know each need. You know those who are in need of healing, for those recovering it from surgery, for those going through rehabilitation. For those in mourning, Lord, we pray that your love would embrace them, that, Father, your peace would comfort them. We pray especially, Lord, for the Matsumoto family as they mourn the loss of Eric, that you would be their guide and their shield. Thank you so much, Lord, that we can call on your name. And Father, we pray for our church, for our community, for our country, that truly as a people, we would turn back to you. And Father, we pray that during this time of unprecedented um, anxiety and, and fears and not knowing what's gonna happen, we know, Lord, that you are in control. Thank you so much. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. good morning it is good to be here in god's house let's go to the lord in prayer dear heavenly father we do thank you for this time that we can come together as a church family both in person and online to worship you we thank you for this opportunity now that in our worship service to study your word and i pray that in this time you will use me to deliver your message your truth and that you'll not only guide my words, but that your spirit will move amongst us and convict and challenge us today. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pastor Sterling asked me to begin and launch a new series. And he titled the, the series, There's an App for That. And at first I had to do a double take because I wasn't quite sure. But then when he explained it, it made perfect sense that we have come to this place with everything happening in our world that it feels like there are a lot of difficulties there are a lot of choices to be made and as we navigate what choices we make as we navigate life's journey i think there's some timeless biblical truths of wisdom that were not only true then, but are most certainly true to help us navigate what we have to go through today. And as I began praying through, and he gave me quite a bit of liberty on how to launch this series, I think most of us know that Proverbs has a lot of short sayings and how to apply our lives in everyday situations. But the more I began to look through all those different sayings, I began to realize that unless I set the stage today, that we would miss the point entirely on what lay behind the emphasis of each and every one of those sayings. And without coming to a real understanding of what wisdom is, that every single message beyond this really couldn't be framed in proper context. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time today looking at what exactly is godly wisdom. And I say godly wisdom because I'll tell you now that the world most definitely has another idea of what wisdom is all about. And I'm going to tell you, it runs counter to God's wisdom. And so to get an idea, a better idea rather, of what God's wisdom is all about, I think we have to turn back to the very beginning of the book of Proverbs. And if we go to chapter 1 in Proverbs, we find out, sure enough, these are the Proverbs of King Solomon. But now look at verse 2. Their purpose is to teach people wisdom and discipline, to help them understand the insights of the wise. Their purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives, to help them do what is right, just, and fair. These Proverbs will give insight to the simple knowledge and discernment to the young. Did you notice in both verses 2 and 3, it tells us very clearly the purpose. It's to teach. So what this means is that from the very beginning, as Solomon is sharing these proverbial truths, his wisdom, the very fact that it can be taught implies that it can be learned. And so right away from the beginning, we have this aspect, this, this component of this godly wisdom that it means it's something that we can de become developed, it can be learned, but it goes even further than that. And to really 
understand that, we have to jump ahead to verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And so now we find out it's not just any kind of learned knowledge, but specifically a knowledge rooted and sourced in God Almighty. It's interesting because this fear that's referenced here, just so you understand better, it's a reverence to God. It's one that speaks of respect, of reverence, of awe. It means that we're putting God into a proper perspective, understanding who He is, what He does, and our relationship to Him. So while the purpose is taught, this wisdom now goes to looking at God Himself, that He is the source of that wisdom. And as I shared early, this runs counter to what the world says. And I like how 1 Corinthians 3.19 puts it, that the wisdom of the world is foolishness in God's sight. And we get this contrast now, what the world says is important and what God says is important. And what we see is the primary difference is that what the world says is important is all about your own personal needs and thinking about all about you. But godly wisdom puts his priorities first. Thinking of others, thinking about him. So as we begin to see the practical teachings that we get, it goes even deeper than just practical teachings. It's teaching centered around God's wisdom. And I like, because it is God's wisdom, James 1.5 tells us if any of, it lack, if any of us lack it, he gives abundantly. We know this to be true not only in the New Testament through James, but even when we look back to King Solomon's life. If you remember the story after he became king, if you jump back to Chronicles or 1 Kings, back in 1 Kings chapter 3, we get a picture of a young king. The Bible says he loves God, he follows the statutes, and he's constantly giving offering and praise to God Almighty. And as he's serving God, ruling the country, the Lord comes to Solomon in a dream and basically asks him, what can I give you? It's interesting because it even notes that for many people, they would think about riches, power, different things. But Solomon's request to God was that he would have wisdom, that he would have a better understanding in how to lead his people, that he would be able to discern what is right and wrong. And sure enough, God gave him this wisdom. So much so but that by the time we get to 1 Kings chapter 4, it's described this way. God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure and breadth of mind like the sand of the seashore. He was wiser than all other men. So with that wisdom that comes from God, let's jump back now to chapter 4, verses 2 through 4. I think this gives us a clearer understanding of what godly wisdom entails. And the more I looked at it, I think it comes down to four major components. First, what we saw in verse 7 is that it comes from God. That when it comes to godly wisdom, He is the source, He is the one that provides it, and it centers around Him. Second, is the fact that we see here that it can be taught is that godly wisdom entails some form of knowledge. It's a knowledge of who He is, what He does, and I think the best way to gain that knowledge is to spend time with God and spend time in the Word. Third, what we see in the verses here, the purpose here is not only to teach, but it also says to understand the insights of the wise. I think the third component is not just knowledge, but there's an understanding that has to happen. I think it's really easy to memorize things, 
to accumulate a lot of intellectual facts in our mind. But wisdom goes beyond just knowing about, but actually understanding this in your life. And I think this is why as people get older, we often equate that with wisdom. Because in that understanding, it comes from experience. But make no mistake that in this understanding, it's possible to grow older but not wiser. The key in this understanding is that because the source is God, we're experiencing God in our lives. We're experiencing His work. We're seeing Him. We're learning from our mistakes, and we come to a better understanding of His Word. But finally, there's a fourth component. It comes from God. It involves knowledge. It involves understanding. And then finally, it involves action. This passage here says that it helps them to do what is right, just, and fair. And I think this makes a lot of sense. Because when I look back at the Hebrew word for wisdom, this is a word that just, it's more than knowledge. It's talking about a type of skill, an applied knowledge. The very word itself involves acting upon it. Wisdom necessitates not only knowing, not only understanding, but then having all of that shape the very way you act and having it shape what you do. It shapes our actions on a daily basis. And as you bring all this together, I think we can come to a working definition of what godly wisdom is all about. And what I put here is that wisdom is knowing and understanding God's truth and applying it to our everyday choices. I think this brings all the four components that we've seen in the verses prior, that it comes from God, that involves knowledge, that in understanding and application. And I like that it goes down to our everyday choices. Because I think whether we realize it or not, the choices we make every day do have large impacts on what happened to us. You know, I'm involved in a board, Christian one. And as I sit on this board as a trustee, we were faced with a major decision. It was one where the press actually came, reported upon it. And I remember that as we were praying about what we would do, how we would vote, I must have heard at least four other trustees repeat some variation of this. This is so difficult of a decision. We need Solomonic wisdom. And I think what he was getting at is that the decision that had to be made would impact so many lives. But the reality was, was there was no way to make everyone happy. That no matter what choice we chose, there would be those that felt, well, I wasn't cared for in this. And it's interesting because as we prayed together, as we sought this wisdom from God, I couldn't help but think in this major decision that had to be made, that we wouldn't be there that day if the small everyday choices along that journey were done with God in mind. And before I realized it, I began looking back at the past steps and said, in hindsight, sure enough, if we made a different choice there, here, 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 along the way, I don't think we'd be making this monumental decision today. I think it would have looked very differently. And this is why in this definition, I say it's applying to our everyday choices. Because I want you to realize that the little choices we make each and every day, the ones we may not think are consequential, can add up and become cumulative to a point that it steers us very far from where we need to be.
And so as we look at this picture of what wisdom is, I want us to remember first and foremost that it comes from God. But in the coming weeks as we look at the rest of the Proverbs, remember that this idea of wisdom is behind every single one of those practical teachings and Proverbs that we will come across. But as Proverbs begins to develop further, then gives us this insight. It's not just all about wisdom, but how we apply that wisdom. And Proverbs likes to put this journey, it gives us this image of being on a path, the right path. And it uses this imagery that as we're on this path, it's giving us wisdom so that we know how to stay on that path. But in giving us this wisdom and setting the stage for all these practical teachings and how to navigate, it does illustrate that there are times as we're navigating being on that path that it doesn't seem so straight anymore. That it seems like we can't tell where the next step's supposed to go. That the fog has come down and we can't see ahead again or it looks so curvy that we don't know where we're headed anymore. And so Proverbs begins to spell out a little bit deeper. Now you have this wisdom, but now this is how you apply it. And I like how it puts it in that famous two verses in Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your paths straight. So all of a sudden now we have this godly wisdom applied to these everyday choices. But when we can't seem to figure out where that straight path is, clear as day, Proverbs 3 says, trust Him, not your own way, and He will give you that straight path again. You want to know which way to go? You trust God. But then Proverbs gets a little bit interesting now. That now that you know which one is the straight path, it presents you with a whole other scenario. It says, now that you know that it's straight, what happens when you come to the fork in the road? What happens when you come to those big choices that need to be made? And this brings us to the passage where we'll focus on today in Proverbs chapter 9. Because as we look at this idea of coming to forks in the road, knowing where wisdom comes from, knowing now that we need to trust God to make sure we're going straight, what happens when we see two different directions? I think Proverbs 9 describes this scenario, this fork in the road, in very broad terms. In the chapters prior, it gives us this discourse of a father teaching and pouring into his son. And as this son grows older into a young man, by the time we get to chapter 9, this young man is now being confronted by two choices personified as women. One of these women represents wisdom. The other represents folly. The father has spent years pouring into his son, training him, teaching him. Remember, when we look at wisdom, it's not just the knowledge, it's not just the understanding, it's now into application. What are you going to do with it? And now that he's grown, he has to make this choice. Wisdom, folly. I think the modern day equivalent would be a parent pouring into their child and finally comes the day when they have to leave the house and go off, let's say, to college. And as they leave on their own with a sense of independence, you hope that you have taught them everything you need to. You hope that they'll make sound, wise choices. But now that they're away, they're confronted with these two directions. In this case, this young man, two women calling his name. Come. He has a choice to make. 
But the reality is we all have a choice to make. Let's jump forward to Proverbs chapter 9. This chapter is actually split up into two parts. The first half is a call from Lady Wisdom calling, saying, come. The second, the second half of this chapter is a woman personified, folly, also saying, come. I split this up into those two halves, so as we read through it, we'll look at each section because I think it highlights the contrast between them even better. But let me read the first three verses of chapter 9. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She slaughtered her bees. She's mixed her wine. She set her table. She has sent out her young women to call from the highest places in the town. Jumping ahead now to the contrast. Verse 13. The woman folly is loud. She is seductive and knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house. She takes a seat on the highest places of the town, calling to those who pass by who are going straight on their way. I think what we see is we begin to see some similarities. We begin to see some clear contrast between these two. If you look at verse 1 as we're introduced, that wisdom has built her house, we get this picture of preparation, of building, of getting ready. But it's not just any house. One constructed with seven pillars means it is a massive house. The picture being laid is that there is a mansion, an enormous mansion, awaiting. I'm not going to go too much into it because different commentators have gone into what do seven pillars actually represent, and they have come through with a plethora of things. But the one thing they've agreed with is that the number seven at least shows completeness. And so what happens is wisdom, is that there's this complete aspect in this large mansion calling forth. But it goes even further now. Verse 2 telling us, not only is this incredible match in here, but she is preparing a table. It says that she slaughtered her beasts. This is simply saying that in a time where mostly fruits and vegetables and other things, that this was a feast of enormous proportion. It was a luxury about to happen because they were going to have meat. She was getting all the meat ready to prepare for the feast. It wasn't just going to be watered, served, but she was getting the wine ready as well. If you contrast that later to woman folly, it's simply bread and water that she serves. And as the preparations continue, wisdom sends out her messengers to invite. Contrast to verse 15 with folly, loudly calling out, just sitting there, come! And then when she grabs someone's attention, it tells us not only is it loud, but now it becomes seductive. Before I move on in the passage, I have to highlight two important cultural considerations about that region, about that time in the ancient Near East. First, whether we talk about Israel or the surrounding countries, they had a custom that the highest point would be the place where they worshipped. And so we know Solomon built his temple on the highest point. We know that even in flat areas, they built up so that they could put their place of worship from the highest point. So as wisdom calls from the highest point in town, this is a direct allusion to this is coming from God, from his temple, his house. But in the same way, when folly comes from the highest point sitting in that doorstep. It's pointing to all those false gods at the time, the idols that surround as well. And this gives us a better picture of what that seduction is all about. It's the false gods, the things that steer us away from God Almighty. It's the things that steer us away from the one true God. 
But the second cultural custom that you need to be aware of is not only about the site's place or the location is key, but it involves the simple invitation to invite someone to a meal. In that culture, in that time, you only invited those who are very close to you to share a meal with you. Or you gave the request to someone you wanted to begin an intimate knowledge with, intimate relationship with. And so as both sides, wisdom and folly, are preparing this, the custom here now is is that what she's preparing is not just any meal, but one where she's saying, I want you to have an intimate relationship with me. This is going to be a part of you. This is going to have long-lasting ramifications. So the stage is now being set. Wisdom with all the preparation calling out, come. Folly also calling seductively. We move on as the passage continues to verse 4. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. To him who lacks sense, she says, come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I've mixed. Folly says almost identical if we look at verse 16. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. And to him who lacks sense, she says, stolen water is sweet. And bread eaten in secret is pleasant. Both sides calling out the simple. It's referring to somebody who is immature, somebody who lacks wisdom. Most of it we understand from the verse, but when we get to verse 17, let me clarify. When Folly talks about stolen water and bread eaten in secret, this is a direct allusion back to Proverbs 5 with sexual infidelity. The seduction she talks about here begins to lure him away even further. So we have wisdom with the much more lavish feast saying, come, Woman folly seducing, luring him away. Verse 7 now as the passage continues. We get a little bit of a transition, a middle ground between these two women calling. It's a reminder of what wisdom is all about. Verse 7, whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse, and he who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. Do not reprove a scoffer or he'll hate you. Reprove a wise man and he'll love you. Give instruction to a wise man and he will still be wiser. Teach a righteous man and he will increase in learning. I think these verses get inserted here because after we get, if you're reading this straight through, after we get the call from wisdom, I think for everyone else hearing this proverb, it's this reminder of what wisdom is all about, remembering that it centers around God. Not only have we seen already how good it is, how the preparation is made, but before we hear the call from folly, it's this reminder of what it's all about. And as it points out the difference between scoffing and wisdom here, There's one thing I want to point out. Is that as many times as I've read this comparison, as many times as I've talked about it with others, I don't think I've ever come across another believer that said, I want to be on the scoffer side. As a believer, they say, yep, wisdom, that's it. The wise man, that's the side I want to be on. I think for all of us, if we go back to that definition of wisdom, we know, we understand, but the problem is, are we putting it into practice and application in our lives? And so as we see this contrast, as we see what a scoffer does, what someone who's being mocked versus someone who is wise, let me ask you this. 
when somebody comes to correct you, when somebody comes to give you feedback and criticism, how do you react? Is it with disdain? Because Proverbs says that's how the scoffer reacts. Or is it with love and appreciation because that's how great your desire to grow even more in wisdom and learn from your mistakes? Because that's described as the wise person. And when we look at it this way, it becomes a reality check. Yes, we want to be the wise person, but are we actually acting upon what we know to be true? And as much as we want to be that person, it means that it changes how we act. It means that we act in love, with care, with a desire to want to grow closer to God, to grow in Him. That little interlude continues on at verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the Holy One is insight. For by me your days will be multiplied and your years will be added to your life. If you're wise, you're wise for yourself. If you scoff, you alone will bear it. Verse 10, that reminder that wisdom has that right view of God. But then it adds all the other benefits that come with wisdom. Verse 12, if it's a little bit confusing, as it says, if you're wise, you're wise for yourself. It's a saying at that time that basically says you got to take personal responsibility. The choice you make, it's either going to benefit you, so you're wise, you're going to get wise for yourself. Or you're going to have to reap the consequences. If you scoff, you alone will bear it. And so it's setting the stage before it introduces the call from folly, saying, these are the two sides. The choice seems to be clear. But whichever road you go down, you will have to pay and make, be responsible for the choice you make and pay the consequences or reap the benefit. And this brings us now to the close of the passage with the two women calling in verse 6 and verse 18. Verse 6, leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of insight. And then folly saying, but he does not know that the dead are there, that our guests are in the depths of Sheol. As we come to the end of each invitation, For verse 18, as seductive as the invitation may have seemed, the young man has no idea that those being invited to that are already dead. And if you're not familiar with what Sheol is, it's a figurative term for the grave or what we would modern consider hell. That what looks pleasing on the outside is so far away from the life that comes from Christ. And the more I began to look at these two sides, trying to figure out why in the world is this even a tough choice for so much of the world? It seems clear as day, the mansion, the feast, the substance, the one true God, seems like a very easy choice. But then as I really read the ending of that invitation from wisdom, I realized it carried some weight. Leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of insight. That as no brainer of a choice as it may be, the call is you got to leave what you've been doing in the past and grow. And for so many, it's just easier to continue doing what is wrong, what seems immediate gratification, even if it keeps steering you the wrong way. And time after time, people choose folly. Even though as many times as we read this passage, we know, I want wisdom. But yet they can't give up what they know. 
And the reality is, is that to leave those simple ways behind, it does require a step of faith. It requires us to trust God. It requires us going in a new direction with Him. Think of this outside of the call for wisdom. I think the very same thing happens in the gospel message as it is preached. There are so many who are lost. They are hurting, but they are scared to leave behind what they know. But the reality is, is that the other side is so much more. It brings life. It brings relationship. It brings hope. It brings joy. And for those who have experienced it, it is clear as day, this is the only way. And in the same way, you as a believer understand this is the only way. When we navigate life, the choices that need to be made, we have to remember there is only one way, and that is through God's wisdom, not the ways of this world. But please, church, it's not enough to know it. It is time to put it into practice. Look back at our definition of wisdom. It's knowing God's truth. Do you know God's truth in your life? Are you spending time in the Word to even know what He desires, what He instructs out of us? Do you understand His truth? Are you spending time on an everyday basis experiencing Him in your life, watching Him work, learning as He shapes you? Are you applying that truth to the choices you need to make every single day? Think of it this way. If this is rooted in God, the greatest command is to love Him with all of our hearts. But the second is to love our neighbors as ourselves. When it comes to every choice we make day in, day out, both the big ones, the little ones? Is it centered around this desire to seek God, to love Him, and to love the people around? Or are the choices you're making centered around your own personal needs? I want to share with you a story out of David Nasser's book, A Call to Die. In this book, he tells about a young man named Chris. This gentleman Chris recounts a story of his mission work in Calcutta, India. And this was an eye-opening ministry for him. He worked alongside Mother Teresa. It was a ministry called the House of the Dying. On its first examination of the ministry, I couldn't quite understand, but, 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 because their ministry was the recognition that this city was so poor, so large, that people were dying every single day in it in the streets. And that they actually had city workers that went through to pick these dead bodies up and then carry them away to, to dispose of them. And so what this ministry saw was that they would go through the streets and say, we don't have the resources to help this vast number of people, but we can find the ones that are on the brink of dying. If they're going to die within hours, within that day, we will gather them and let them die in dignity. We will bring them to our office. We will give them fresh clothes. We will bandage their wounds. We will give them a meal, maybe their first meal in I don't know how long. And we will share the gospel. So that even though this may be their final hours, they have an opportunity to know God. And the crazy thing is that as he tells the stories of the people that he would find and bring back to just show them respect, to let them die in peace, to share who Christ is. He came to the recognition that in the streets of Calcutta, the homeless, over 70% of them had tuberculosis. And this meant they'd be coughing up disease, spewing out blood. That their hair would be full of filth and grime. And so the first thing he would do would have to be to shave their head just so that they'd have some cleanliness. He'd give them this jar so that if they coughed up this blood, it, it would, they had somewhere to go. As the jars filled up, He'd throw it into the garbage. He would put that shaved, disgusting hair in there. The very clothes that they had, the stench. 
he'd put it into the garbage. But not only was it this massive population of tuberculosis, there was this group that had leprosy. A disease that for those near the end of life, it caused their flesh to literally rot off of them. And so the clothes that they had was full of this rotten flesh embedded in it. And in these final hours that they had, he would try to nurse their wounds. There'd be these pus-filled pockets and he'd get a syringe and drain them so that they'd have a little bit of comfort. And so the garbage would begin to have this other disease-ridden material. And he had this thing as he cared for the people. He shared that he had this insight, a dread. It wasn't so much going into the streets. It wasn't so much caring for these people. But with the garbage that was piling, with how nasty it was, how stink, how full of stench it was, he did not want to take it out to the dump. It was just putrid. But then came the day in that ministry where he had to grab the garbage bags, stench and all, full of disease, full of disgust. And he carried these bags out the back door of that ministry to take it to the dump to throw it in. And as he's carrying these bags, Chris was horrified because little children began running to him from the alleys all around. And at first he didn't realize what was going to happen because he simply didn't want the stench to touch them. But then these young children began ripping the bags open because they knew that there'd be little bits of food still left from the people that didn't finish their last meal. And now, instead of holding these bags in horror, he's going, no, no, this is full of death. It's disease. What are you doing? And he couldn't stop the children. They continued to grab this disease-ridden food just so that they could have sustenance. No matter how many times he says, no, that's the wrong choice. For the child, it seemed like the only choice. The reality, as shocking as that may be, is that so many of us today do the very same thing in our spiritual lives. That the sin that abounds in the world around, the things that are disease-ridden, steering us the wrong way, causing death, is what so many of us so eagerly rip open and say, give it to me now. When Scripture is so clearly telling us, no, it's causing death. It's easy to look at others and say, don't you get it? But what Proverbs does, it's a reminder to look at our own hearts and the choices we're making day in, day out. And coming to a recognition that the choices we make matter and to get back on that right path, it most certainly requires godly wisdom. My hope is that as we continue in this series, as we read through the practical teachings of Proverbs, you keep this as the backdrop the foundation to what frames the rest of Proverbs. The fact that every single one of those teachings revolves around God and God alone, that His wisdom is what we need, and that as we apply it to our lives, it's not about what's best for us, but how to honor Him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, We do thank you for your goodness, your grace, that even it seems when we're so lost going down the wrong road that you continue to reach out, love us, and bring us back. I pray that all of us have the humbleness to know that each and every one of us has room to grow. It's not so much denying, oh, I'm not the way of folly, 
but instead asking you, Lord, Lord, how do I seek you more? How do I grow in you? How do I become more wise in you? Lord, help me to discern what is right and wrong. Help me to be wiser. Lord, give me that godly wisdom so that as I navigate life, as I encounter these choices, that you are at the heart of every decision. It is your plan that I seek. It's you that I want to honor. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, church, for joining us today in our worship time. My prayer is that as we go out, we continue to seek His wisdom and apply it to our lives in all that we do. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, be with this church family as we go out. Continue to guide us, and we pray that you will give us your wisdom to help discern what is right, to help understand what needs to be done, and to help continue to guide us to do things that honor you. We thank you in all this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless.